As we come to reflect upon God's word, first let us come before the Lord in prayer. Lord, it is one thing to be able to access this book. And we live in an age where it is more accessible than it has ever been. Lord, it is something to hear the words spoken with another's tone and inflection. Yet, Lord, how we hear it in our own mind. Altogether, we need your guidance. And even as we reflect on these words and consider them, Lord, we pray for your truth to be evident in guiding our lives in your light. All that we may, in all things, glory and praise you and you alone. This in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are those who do and will reject you. Not because of you, but because they fear faith, belief, any belief that is not their own. And if they have no belief, that is especially true. And it is those who fear everything. There are those who might proclaim a, a Christianity, it seems, with their mouths, but who obviously reject Christ by their actions. They reject Christ by their doctrines. They believe in their religion. They believe in a form of faith, the ritual around faith. But the object of their faith is not God's will or the one who God's will points to. Do you believe in creation or the creator? If you only believe in creation, then you believe in that which fades away. But if your faith is in the creator, then you will know the reality of creation and its purpose as it is and as we glorify God. Jesus was oftentimes deeply confronted by the worldliness of the world he came to save. And there were many who rejected Jesus simply because he proposed something different than what they knew. The Samaritans had a belief in God, rooted in the same words, the same central law, doctrine. A belief that wasn't all that dissimilar. If you were to see them side by side with Jewish, Jewish belief from this day to then, you would see these radical similarities. But because Jesus in that day and age presented himself, his face appeared as one pointed towards Jerusalem, an obvious Jew, whether by carriage, whether by words, whether by garments, whatever identified this face as one on, their, on his way to Jerusalem. They rejected him. Not all people rejected him, obviously. But it was the majority of the village. It was the predominant feeling in the village as those who were sent before Jesus encountered them. And in today's reading, we read of Jesus' rejection. But that wasn't something that was just isolated to Samaritans when it came to Jesus either. Pharisees regularly confronted Jesus because he lacked their orthodoxy. He did not follow their rules. And what of the church today? When denominations collide with our beliefs around saints and sacraments, or around Christ, and some want us to just meld all back together, and others want us all to fall under one banner, and others to reject the rest and preserve themselves as some precious remnant. Where is Christ in this? And we need to ask that question. There is a great fear of faith against the church, and even within it because the world has no understanding of that faith. And they fear what they do not understand while we within the faith fear what we also struggle to understand. 
Fear even being noticed as not understanding. Have you ever found yourself or avoided a situation because you didn't know the faith answer? What was the right answer? What's the right thing to say? I tell you right now, not even ministers who spend their life studying the word have all the answers. So don't look to them alone. Look to the whole of the church. Look to the fellowship that you've been given. Because fear about what they might discover about us, what they might realize that we don't really, we're not really as confident as we, as we seem to be, as we appear to be. We're not as sure as we think we are. We're not as certain as we hoped to be. We haven't worked everything out. And if people discover that, let me tell you, the authenticity of that vulnerability is a tremendous open door. That too many churches have closed. We are so fearful, we do not speak. We do not mission. We do not evangelize against the tide of disbelief and other belief and non-belief and lost belief. And some of the disciples wanted to respond to the weak faith and those who reject Jesus saying, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elias did? That kind of attitude out there, no wonder people are afraid. Do you remember the account that the disciples are quoting from? From 1 Kings 18, when the prophet Elijah rebuilt the altar to God, sets sacrifice on it, ordered it soaked with barrel loads of water, and on Elijah's request, fire came down and burned everything up, even the water, and the people, seeing that the Baal priests were false, ran them down to the brook, and every one of those Baal priests were killed. This is what the disciples are proposing to deal with that village that rejected Jesus. Let's recognize that first. Faith responses can be extreme. Jesus' disciples were given an extreme reaction to this. The Baal prophets worshipped false gods and were aiming to kill Elijah and every remaining Israelite who believed in God. The Samaritans were not showing good hospitality. They didn't believe in Jesus, nor shared many of the beliefs of the Jews. Neither did the disciples, for that matter. They struggled with things that Jesus was saying, but he didn't bring down angels to smite them. Our reactions to the faith of others, the differences of faith, or even the lack of faith, must not be a condemnation or a ridicule or a persecution. And that has been too often what people presenting themselves as Christians have done, and it has harmed the church. It's in our heritage. And that needs acknowledgement. That will need some forgiveness. If anyone is going to have, trust a thing that we have to say or any truth we proclaim. And so we do apologize. We apologize for the harshness with which we proclaim the gospel. That isn't love. And we recognize that the gospel can only truly spoken where love is shown, not where hatred or indifference is presented. Jesus turns to his disciples and responds to their request and condemnation, saying, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Jesus is telling, first of all, for the disciples, to learn their place. How does Jesus respond to rejection? He moves on to the next village. Remember when Jesus sent out his disciples in Luke and Matthew's gospel, both chapter 10. He said to them, Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. 
Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor you staves, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute, and if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust off your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Those who reject Jesus, those who do not declare Christ Jesus as Lord, God does not ignore them. Those who will not hear the gospel of the kingdom of God in Jesus Christ are accountable and it is God who will bring that judgment. And that is a promise. And that is a hard promise in many ways. Because you will know these people. They will not be strangers. They might not even be seemingly to you. They might be not people that you call them. They might be people that you call us. Jesus says in Luke chapter 17 verse 33. Whosoever shall seek his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. And I tell you in the night there shall be two men... In a bed, one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two men shall be in the field, one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. This is not that Jesus seeks to reject any of these. He mourns them. Even on the way to the cross, he cautions those who weep for Christ's suffering, saying, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. The lesson does not end with those who reject Christ. For Jesus continued on away from the villages and he encounters those who will believe with conditions. The negotiated believer who knows what they want to believe in and will believe in it as long as it's, one, the going thing, and as so long as Christianity remains that, that, that mainstream view. <clears throat> we may have had Christendom, where all the world seemed Christian, and the churches had say and sway on how society operated, and some of the worst atrocities were committed by the human race, on the human race, and on creation too, during that period. We should not be too keen to get on a popular Christianity. And Christ confronts such an attitude with a stern reminder simply by pointing out that a life of faith does not result in comfort and ease. As he points to his own example saying, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. If your life is to be the life of faith, if that's what you want, Want all that comes with it. And maybe it's not what you like. But know that in order to do God's will, being uncomfortable is often required. Yet, even within the living of an honest, humble faith, in the real hurdles of living, the responsibilities of family, and all we have worked for and achieved, are we expected to just set this all aside? Do we abandon our children or our families to do God's will? Is that the Christian way being proposed here? Are these things, aren't these things the reason that we are here? That we have the abilities that we do? That we love who we love? At the very least, shouldn't we be permitted a reasonable departure like Elisha was offered? Something that leaves everyone happy. They had a good meal when he went out to, to be a prophet. More than your life. Your faith requires that we acknowledge that everything we have and everything that we are are called to the service of God and the glory of God. And everything that Elijah was about before, he sacrificed. He gave out to God's people. And he says, I go to serve. Killed the oxen. He used the, the yoke of the oxen to cook the meal. Everyone was fed and satisfied and he went out to serve the Lord. 
because he wasn't coming back. And the more we realize that the less power any of us try to enact in this faith, the more we are empowered by God to live this faith. When it is about our will, we are distracted from God's will. Think about what Jesus surrendered. What does he give up when he prays, not my will, but thine, O Lord? Does home, family, job, reputation, comfort, stability all serve the glory of God in your life? Ask. Look at your life and ask. Is any of it meant as an offering? Something fit for the kingdom of God? There is no turning back now, but there is moving forward. And through faith by God's grace in Jesus Christ, the way is set and the course is straight. Set your hand to the plow.